in this video, I'm going to illustrate the basic uh, annular duct test case that I've been using to debug and ensure proper implementation of the cyclic uh, boundary condition um, for sliding or even stationary interfaces between non-matching regions in open foam. Here we're going to be using the uh, development branch of open foam, which has merged in the changes from the uh, fixes to the cyclic periodic AMI uh, branch that I or uh, boundary condition that uh, I worked with openfoam.com uh, uh, ESI developers to correct over the summer. So I have a test case here, and first let's have a look at what's here. Um, what we see is what I've created here is a uh, basically two regions, each of which starts out as its own open foam case folder. Um, so these are called downstream and upstream dot back for backup, and we'll see why that one's called backup later. Um, there's also a system dot setup, constant dot setup, and zero dot setup folder, and these essentially contain the files. Um, other than you know the grid uh, that would be in those folders, uh, the constant zero and system folders for the final case, and they'll get copied over at the end. Finally, we see a script run steps um, x.sh, um, and if I just have a look at what that looks like, I'll use the micro editor. What we see here is that this is just a bash script, um, and um, basically what this is going to do is going to go through a series of steps where it's going to um, prepare the grids, uh, merge them, and get everything ready. So I'm going to quickly walk through what this does um, rather than executing each line one at a time. And then I'll look, we'll have a look at what's in these uh, source upstream and downstream folders before we proceed to, to actually run this. So the first thing that this does here on line uh, five is set the number of processors for parallel execution. This is really arbitrary. I just use six here because of, for the size of the case, it sort of runs reasonably on my laptop, but you could change this to any useful number you like. Um, and then uh, here I'm just copying the backup upstream folder to a new upstream folder um, so that we're, when we're going to maybe make some edits here, it's not going to edit what's in the original uh, backup. So then we're going to go into that upstream folder um, just going to clear out uh, any mesh that may be existing in there just to make sure we're working with a clean case. And then uh, I'm going to run block mesh and we'll look at the block mesh dictionary file in that upstream uh, region um, when we're done going through this script. But basically, um, it's just going to create an annular region, um, a, short, a relatively short annular region, which is the upstream region. And then you're going to see here six times in a row, this is a little crude and I don't yet know a sort of more elegant way to do this, but this is a, a kind of a pretty simple way to add uh, boundary layers to uh, grids in, in open foam. You can just run this refine wall layer command dash overwrite sort of updates the existing in place grid, grid and then this gives the, the boundaries on which I want to apply it. So the hub and shroud. And then the 0.7 factor is essentially the the fraction of the, you know, how much you want to split the last cell. So I run this six times and this creates sort of a, a reasonable boundary set of boundary layer cells. And that turns out to be very important for the um, sort of, you know, behavior of the algorithm because the turbulence equations don't sort of behave well without decently resolved boundary layers. Then I go back up a level. Then I go into the downstream folder and do exactly the same steps, adding the down, the uh, boundary layers uh, to the hub and shroud in the downstream region. The downstream region is much longer um, because I want the exit of the domain to be far enough away um, to not really impact the flow in the region of the interface. Then I go back up a level again. So now we're kind of outside of the case folders and we're going to copy um, the system.setup uh, folder contents to the system folders of both case folders upstream and downstream. And then this is the key one where we run the merge meshes command. So note this needs to be run in sort of the top level folder, so not within either case folder. And it takes two arguments, uh, the initial case and the second case. 
and by using this dash overwrite command, um, basically it's going to not create some random time folder with the results. It's going to put it all together. And the key thing is that the first one argument we give here is where the final merged mesh ends up. So the upstream case ends up having the whole mesh. And that's why here we move it to, we call the combine and this takes a command line argument one. This script expects a command line argument, which can be anything. Um, but whatever you put, it's going to put here. So if I were to say, put the number, you know, one, this would be called combined one. If I put, you know, Bob, it would, this folder would be called combined Bob. Um, so we'll see that when we execute it. Then we're going to go into that folder and we're going to run the create patch, uh, command using the two separate dictionaries to create the cyclic boundaries as well as the interface. Um, and we'll review what's in those files, um, a little later on. And then the renumber mesh is just to make sure that the, the ordering of the cells is an efficient one. Then we're going to copy the um, transport properties and turbulence uh, and other relevant uh, constant uh, property files from the setup constant folder into our fit cases constant folder. We'll make the zero directory and then copy the contents of the zero dot setup folder to our zero directory. So in other words, we're going to, the contents of that zero dot setup directory is going to have the boundary condition configuration for the whole case, um, not for, you know, either just the upstream or just the downstream part. Then we're going to write uh, topo set. Um, there's going to be a top, this automatically without arguments, this is going to use the system topo set dict file. So we'll have a look at that and see what that does. This is something um, to do with setting cell regions um, uh, related to parallel decomposition. And then we run it again for another dictionary for the um, interface uh, setup. And we'll, again, we'll see what these do later on. Then we do the parallel decomposition and run the case. Okay, so now I'm gonna go and first thing we'll do is we'll go and look at the block mesh um, setup files for both the upstream and downstream regions. Uh, then we'll briefly come back to this code to see what we should look at next. Okay, so here's the block mesh dict for the upstream region. Here I define some parameters. The scale is just one, um, so the units are the actual units. Um, so this is hub radius, tip radius, uh, number of blades sort of nominally this is sort of meant to be, you know, a turbo machinery case. Of course, there's no actual blades in this mesh, but um, this is sort of the ends up setting the fraction of annulus that we use. And then uh, Z1 and Z2 are the sort of upstream and downstream uh, axial coordinates of this mesh region. The minimum angle uh, and maximum angle um, set the sort of angular uh, position of this mesh, re mesh region. And here you see an example of an eval statement where um, we're ex using an equation. So we say eval 360 divided by uh, B, right? And so that's going to say 360 divided by 22, and that's going to give us our angular extent. And then we compute a mid angle, which is halfway between, and we need that for setting up the block mesh. Then we have an offset angle here. In this case, it's 45 degrees. Um, and that's going to be how offset the final mesh is from uh, these positions. A sweep angle can be set. Um, here it's set to zero. And this essentially is going to determine whether the uh, hub or, or whether the shroud coordinates are at different angular positions than the hub coordinates. And then this is just a bunch of math to compute the, the locations of all the vertices. Um, and then this defines the vertices, the edges. Um, we only have to specify the ones that are arcs, the ones that are straight lines are implied. Um, and then we define the blocks using the named uh, vertices um, with mesh resolution here. And then the boundary, we set periodic zero and periodic one patches. These are the, um, the, the side cyclic patches. There's an inlet. AMI zero, this is, since this is the upstream region, this is the upstream side of the interface. There's a hub and a shroud wall, and that's it. So when we make a block mesh, it will create this, this grid. We'll have a look at the full mesh when it's assembled at the end.
Now let's have a look at the downstream. And this is looks almost exactly the same. The only real difference is that the Z1 and Z2 are different. So the Z1 here was the Z2 value for the other uh, file. And then Z2 is further, much further downstream. And here the angular offset is zero. So the, the, the two sections of grid are completely offset from each other by 45 degrees. Um, and if we do a quick bit of math and check what 360 divided by 22 is, that's only 16 degrees. So there's actually no overlap at all between the two grid regions, which makes this a good test for um, the interface boundary. And then the rest of this works basically the same. The only difference is that in the boundaries, first note that the periodic zero and periodic one boundaries for the cyclics, these have the same name as in the upstream, and that's fine. There's no problem with that. For the downstream half of the interface, we have AMI one, and now we've got an outlet instead of an inlet. All right, so let's have another look at the script and now let's see what else we might want to check. Let's check these create patch dictionary files, um, which we can for now find in the system.setup folder and see what these do. So first the cyclic and then the AMI. So the create patch.cyclic file, um, there's a lot of comments here. This is the only part that really matters. So here's the list of patches to create. We're gonna need create a patch cyclic zero. It's gonna be a cyclic slip boundary. It's neighbor patch will be called cyclic one using a rotational transform on the X axis. Um, the match tolerance, this is a tricky number to determine. Um, you basically wanna make this as small as you can before it starts throwing errors that it can't match the cells. So it takes a little trial and error but aiming for this to be about half the size of an edge length along the boundary is a good start. Construct from existing patches and the patch we wanna use is patch periodic zero. Note this will uh, include both the upstream and downstream contributions because those patches will be combined when the meshes are merged. And then we do the same thing for cyclic one. The only difference being that the neighbor patch is cyclic zero and it's constructed from patch per one. Now let's look at the arbitrary mesh interface or AMI. This is similar, except we're gonna construct interface zero from AMI zero and interface one from AMI one. Um, and here we are, um, actually I need to update this. Um, because of the updated code, this now just needs to be in group cyclic AMI, not cyclic periodic AMI, though the type is gonna be cyclic periodic AMI. Here we can specify the number of rotational transforms for a full wheel. Um, this actually isn't very critical, um, but it doesn't hurt to throw it in. So I've saved that actually. Since I want maybe made that correction. Now, the next thing we need to want, we want to look at is um, the topo set files. So let's look at the topo set dict and the topo set dict dot interface. So first let's look at the basic topo set and what are we doing here? We're creating a cell zone for all of the moving cells in the inlet region, um, just in case we wanted to do something where that was useful. So we're gonna call it rotating. It's gonna be a cell set. It's a new one. It sources a box um, and here's the definition of the box that basically captures everything upstream of uh, between Z coordinates zero and 1.25. And it's gonna be called the uh, rotating zone. Uh, it's a cell zone set. And uh, we then we're gonna sorry, basically convert this set to a cell zone. Um, so there's a cell set as well as a cell zone. This turns out um, not to be super critical, but it, 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 it can be helpful depending on what you wanna do. And then if we look at the version for the interface, what this is doing, we're gonna create a face set for the AMI patches to avoid having process or boundaries cross them because there could be a potentially an issue with uh, parallel decomposition. So by creating this face uh, set F1, um, we basically put the, the interface patches in this and we're gonna basically put a constraint on the parallel decomposition that this face set must live on one processor. 
And we can look at that right now. If we look at the decomposed project, here's the number of subdomains, six. This has to match what was in the um, NPROC parameter in the script. And um, I'm just doing a simple method here. And the only thing where this is actually doing something is I have this preserve patches. Um, and it's basically to keep all of these patches on um, the same processor, the cyclics and the interface patches. And then um, in addition, um, we have keep all of the face set on a single processor. So basically, um, we're saying that we want this face set F1, which was both interface zero and interface one to live on a single processor. But by passing minus one here, we're saying we don't know, we don't really care which one it is. Okay. So we've reviewed that. I think this is pretty much everything. The last thing we should check is maybe the boundary conditions. So if we check the boundary conditions for velocity, um, let's update this internal field. What's the, uh, to maybe 60 meters a second to, uh, and this is gonna be an inlet swirl velocity um, along the z-axis, axial velocity of 100 meters a second, tangential velocity of 50, and then the initial value will match the internal field. Uh, the outlet, um, here I've got this set to zero gradient. In fact, I think I'm gonna update this. I'll come back to this one in a, actually, no, this is fine. Sorry, this is fine. And then we only need to specify some of the boundaries here. You'll notice the cyclic and um, cyclic AMI boundaries. We don't have to specify anything here because we've included this line, which basically means that those we just use defaults. We can look at K, the turbulence kinetic energy. Here I've set the 5% of, of inlet turbulence intensity. And I've got a calculation here where, where, where we're basically setting the intensity to be uh, IABS. Um, and then the rest is just sort of the standard way of setting these. These can be reviewed if you're interested. Oops. And then for the um, turbulent uh, viscosity, uh, same idea. This is all just calculated using wall functions and inherited values. For omega, because we're using K omega SST turbulence model. Um, we basically set the walls and then for the inlet, it's a mixing length frequency inlet. Um, so it's 7% of the hydraulic uh, diameter, which I think I calculated to be roughly this. Um, and that's sort of a typical value. Um, and, and that's about all for that. For the last field, the pressure, um, we have a couple of options. Here's the best option for now. Um, because of the significant swirl in this flow, setting a fixed static pressure will impose a significant upstream influence. A way to avoid that is to set simply a fixed mean outlet pressure and then set the mean value. What this will do is mean that the average value of the static pressure, essentially the area averaged value of the static pressure, will be zero um, and it'll create whatever distribution is necessary to accommodate that. Um, this means that for an incompressible flow, there's a little bit of uncertainty about what the uh, inlet stagnation pressure is going to be, but it does um, avoid the, the boundary having a large region of upstream influence on the resulting flow. All right. So let's look at run steps one more time, and I think we've covered everything in here. So let's go ahead and run it. So I'm gonna do dot slash run steps X and let's just call it one. So it'll be combined one will be the folder it creates. This is gonna go through and do all those steps, um, including running the solver. So right now it's at the step of doing the parallel decomposition. There we go. Now it's actually running the calculation because if we look again at run steps at the very end, it ran the calculation, but it sent it to the background and to a log file. So if I look at my processors, I can see that I've got six processors running computing this. 
and in our combined one folder, we have this simple foam.log, and I can tail this to see the, pro the, the solver output, which is very uh, verbose. <laughs> um, while this is running, um, I can start pair view, and we can look at what the, the setup of the problem looks like visually um, before we start actually having a solution. case.foam file, we'll open that. This is a decomposed case, and we're not gonna skip zero time because that's the only time folder that's currently saved. So there we go. This is what the, the mesh initially looks like. Actually, why don't I just go to solid color and go surface with edges, and then we can look at what the mesh looks like. So you can see the short version, short part is the upstream region, the big part's the downstream region, so the flow is going um, from uh, kind of upper left to lower right here. Um, and as you can see, there's a complete lack of overlap between these regions, so which makes it a good test for the interface for flow with swirl. Um, I apologize, this is the first time I used this pair view version which has a slightly different looking graphics. So there we go. And you can see what the mesh looks like and you can see those boundary layers we added where we refine the grid um, it's not great. Like I said, it's a rough solution. The ground layer doesn't look very nice, but it's good enough to make the uh, turbulence model behave well. And we can look at what's going on at the exit of the domain as well, and it looks similar there. Let's flip back over to the case and see, okay, it's already at time step 117. So if I refresh this, I think I have it set to save every 70 steps. Um, there we go. So if we switch this back to surface and go to um, a field, um, if we go to the velocity field, I will zoom in in the region near the inlet. Um, what we can see, of course, is the velocity goes to zero near, uh, near the walls, as it should. Um, let me, there we go, rescale to data range. Um, and this is the overall velocity magnitude. If we look at the Z component, this is the axial velocity. And if we hover over points, um, what we can see is that the axial velocity has already reached the sort of 100 meters a second. Although as we go towards the exit, um, we can see um, that the boundary layers are growing and the axial velocity here is about 105. So, um, you know, the boundary layers are growing, which means the velocity in the middle is, is increasing as the velocity towards the edges is decreasing. Um, we have the calculation of a transformed velocity field, and this is actually more useful because this is in cylindrical coordinates already. Um, so the Z component is the Z component. It's the same axial part. Um, if we look at the Y component, we can identify based on the magnitude what this is, and this is going to be the swirl velocity. And what we can see here at this partially converged solution is the swirl velocity is zero near the outlet where it hasn't yet had time to convect all the way through the domain. Um, and it's around 50 near the inlet where we set it. And critically, there's no circumferential non-uniformity, which is what would have been the case with the previous version of this boundary condition, which had errors in it. So the fix has now made this flow circumferentially uniform as it should be. And then the X component here will actually be the radial velocity, which we can see is quite small everywhere and still contains lots of weird errors as the flow um, is, is gradually solved. This is still solving. I see it's at step 210 now. So let's reload again and go to the next step. Uh, actually, why don't we just go right to the last one, 280. This is probably getting close to converged. I'll re... Okay, so we now see this is, again, these uh, radial velocity is now very small. Um, it's primarily caused just by migration of flow away from the walls as the boundary layers thicken. So it's positive near the hub, decreasing as we go downstream, and negative at the shroud, decreasing downstream. If we look at the circumferential velocity, we now see that this has pretty much made its way all the way down the duct with some decrease in swirl due to the boundaries. 
and the axial velocity looks pretty good. One other thing we want to look at is the static pressure. And what we can see is that here at the outlet, the static pressure, if I just go to the visible range, we'll make this more apparent. The static pressure is varying across this boundary um, and on average is zero. Let's go back to the transformed, uh, maybe x velocity and look at the whole thing. And let's see, it's taking a lot of steps to converge. It must be getting close. The use of the um, mean uh, outlet boundary does slow down the convergence a little bit. So let's, uh, let's check on this and go to the last step that we've got, 120. It also depends a lot on the initial uh, guess as all CFD calculations do. Um, so now we can see this is looking quite good. Not much else is changing. The circumferential velocity looks really good as well. And if we look at the static pressure, some kind of odd step there, um, but this is starting to look pretty close to converged. Um, we're now nearly at 500 steps. So this is going by very fast. It might be hard to see in the video. I can barely watch it with my eye, but it's just over 500 steps now. I do have the convergence criteria set to be pretty strict. We can kind of stop watching this and see and get the initial idea of what the residuals look like. Um, of course this level. Um, so the initial residual eight, so it's probably one times 10 to the minus six. Um, and the velocity, uh, this is really small. Um, so I think that very soon this is probably going to be conversion. Probably the solution is not really going to change much from what, um, what we currently are seeing. Um, I will run update this one more time and have a look at what it looks like. And you can see that at this point, the, the flow field is really not changing at all, but we've got the solution we're looking for. And it's just tiny um, errors that are being worked out in the solution as, as it settles down to a final set of values. We can look at the turbulence parameters. Maybe those are what's still uh, updating. K, hi, hi, coming higher from the boundaries as you'd expect. Same thing with nu t. Uh, it, new T is, is highest in the, the core flow, as you'd expect. Um, and omega is uh, sort of small everywhere, except very close to the walls, again, as you'd expect for a sort of nice, well-behaved flow. I'm not entirely sure how long this thing's gonna run for. This is, uh, I don't think I've used exactly this initialization uh, for this case, but it doesn't really matter. You can see the flow field is no longer changing. So hopefully that helps illustrate the process and uh, feel free to get in touch if you've got any more questions about using merge meshes or combining, uh, setting up boundaries or running this sort of case, which is kind of a prototype for a, a traditional, um, you know, single passage turbo machinery calculation. Thank you.